Supracoroidal hemorrhage by definition is accumulation of blood between the choroid and the sclera, but not all supracoroidal hemorrhages are expulsive hemorrhages. Expulsive hemorrhage is what you get during a surgery because of the break in the choroidal um, uh, ciliary arteries um, uh, resulting in uh, massive bleed which pushes the intraocular contents and the intraocular contents start presenting at your wound uh, incision, in, in the surgical incision. Now that is only known as expulsive hemorrhage. The main path of the main cause is hypotony, um, where the choroidal vessels are at a IOP of 12 to 18 millimeter more than the atmospheric pressure. A sudden drop in pressure inside the chamber. What happens is the retinochoroidal complex collapses more than the sclera, and there is a stretching of the um, ciliary arteries in there, uh, and the rupture happens in the intrascleral canal where they are the weakest. So the bleeding happens into the supraschoroidal space as well as sometimes into the suprascleral space. That's why you sometimes see some blood coming through some conjunctival space also. And once it bleeds, it starts pushing the choroid, starts getting opposed, and the, um, uh, the cause from both sides the retinas uh, come towards the center and they touch at the center, co center causing the central retinochoroidal opposition. And um, uh, that's a clinical course. And further, it can push all the contents of the vitreous cavity through the wound. You can have the iris, a lens, um, the vitreous, everything getting pushed through the wound and getting into the section. It's a very, got a very poor prognosis, as you see from this literature. 43% of the eyes become thysical or eviscerated. 41% had no light perception or just light perception vision. Only 11% had greater than counting fingers uh, final vision. It is classified based on the size. When it is uh, just a small supracoroidal hematoma, it's called a limited supracoroidal hemorrhage, or it's called a massive supracoroidal hemorrhage or a kissing supracoroidal hemorrhage when it has either a central retinochoroidal opposition, the both the, what we call as kissing choroidals, or a retinal or vitreous incarceration into the wound. Based on timing, it can be intraoperative uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage when it happens during the surgery um, with the expulsion of the contents causing expulsive, what is known as expulsive supracoroidal hemorrhage or it can be post-operative uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage which happens in a closed system and it's not typically associated with extra expulsion of the intraocular contents. Based on etiology, it can be anesthesia related, retrobulbar blocks are notorious for causing that. Trauma related or surgery related open globe injuries like PKP or vitrectomy, cataract surgery or closed globe surgeries like scleral buckling. And without surgery also what is known as spontaneous supracoroidal hemorrhage that is usually seen with CNVMs or IPCV which bleed subretinally and supracoroidally the blood tracks. Endophthalmitis, melanoma, perforated corneal ulcer, all these can cause spontaneous supracoroidal hemorrhage. There are certain general conditions that predispose to this uh, disease which includes uh, the, um, where the vessels get brittle, mainly in atherosclerosis and aging or high blood pressure, hyperten as in hypertension, female sex, and high episcleral pressure, which is seen in Sturge Weber syndrome, obesity, these are certain systemic conditions that predispose to this condition. Especially steroids and systemic anticoagulants also predispose to supracoroidal hemorrhage. Pre existing ocular pathologies, blunus and cataract, aphakia, glaucoma, retinal detachment, all these can predispose to supracoroidal hemorrhage. And in vitrectomized eyes and in high people with high myopia, the scleral rigidity is very low, that eye tend to collapse very fast, and that can also cause supracoroidal hemorrhage during surgery. And supracoroidal hemorrhage in the fellow eye could be another uh, risk factor in uh, SEH developing in the second eye. Intraoperative predisposing factors are one is cryo, especially while doing buckle, you do cryo and remove the uh, probe without proper thawing, you can fracture the scleral vessels in their intrascleral canal and cause a supracoroidal hemorrhage. Or you can have a broad buckle which can compress the vertex vein and predispose eye to supracoroidal hemorrhage. And while doing external SRF drainage in scleral buckling, that and hypotony induced by the drainage can also cause supracoroidal hemorrhage. And in open surgeries, large incision, open sky procedures, long surgery, all this predispose to um, supracoroidal hemorrhage. Again, PC rent and complications like that also can predispose to supracoroidal hemorrhage. Retrobulbar block, pasplana vitrectomy, valsalva maneuver during surgery, these are again risk factors. And one special risk factor which we see doing silicon oil removal is when we remove, using mechanized removing systems, when we remove the last bubble with high bu pressure, then the globe tend to collapse suddenly and that is a high risk for supracoroidal hemorrhage and it's uh, important that the last bubble is let, uh, let the last bubble go passively rather than using an active suction. And the preoperative prophylaxis is identifying these factors and correct as much as possible. 
and intraoperative prophylaxis again before lowering the IOP, make a small stab wound, release the pressure slowly, and avoid any Vallisalva maneuvers of the patient during the surgery, avoid rapid decompression of the globe, and it's the most important step is recognizing the sub supracoroidal hemorrhage as early as possible and preventing further complications. Postoperatively, you have to again give an eye shield so that trauma can be prevented, avoid hypertony in the postoperative period, and again avoid Vallisalva maneuvers. So coming to early detection during surgery, it's um, Usually what happens is a sudden loss of red reflex um, is the main uh, indicator that something is going wrong and sometimes you are lucky enough to see dark mounds coming up. So that is the time you have to stop your surgery and try to attempt closure of the eye. And other indications could be sudden toning of the firming of the eyeball, uh, shallowing of the um, AC by the lens iris diaphragm moves forward and bleeding into AC or um, uh, unexplained subconjunctival hemorrhage appearing, all this could be an indication that a uh, impending supracoral hemorrhage, expulsive hemorrhage. And during vitrectomy or silicon oil removal, a sudden appearance of blood in the infusion cannula could be an indicator that the supracoral hemorrhage is coming. Emergency management is to stop the bleeding, immediate closure of the wound with whatever material is available, better to use larger uh, sutures and the IOP eleva gets elevated and the, IOP, the blood itself will tamponide further re-bleeding. And if you don't have sutures, at least apply your finger or like some source of effort, a force up, something to stop the, uh, to close the surgical wound. So do, don't open any surgical wound, wait for, uh, close, the, uh, close and finish at that time, don't do any uh, procedures at that time, don't try to evacuate supracoral hemorrhage at that time. Immediate postoperative management is IOP controlled medically, in loose, uh, liberal use of uh, topical and systemic steroids and uh, use cycloplegics and analgesic to control uh, pain and improve the patient comfort. And again, B-scan is the most useful tool for evaluation, diagnosis, and follow-up of um, patients with supracoroidal hemorrhage. Um, again, it, you have to be very careful in interpreting B-scan. If you look at the top uh, left uh, picture, there were, there's a massive supracoroidal hemorrhage, and somebody might mistake this for a vitreous hemorrhage because the choroidals are not seen. The giveaway sign is just in front of the disc. There is a tra small triangular area, a collucent area, that tells you this is not a simple vitreous hemorrhage, but a supracoroidal hemorrhage. If attempting to do a vitrectomy in this eye can be very disastrous. So it has to be reckoned. And as you do sequential B-scan, you see the score, the uh, clot starts liquefying, the, the choroid appears better seen, and the supracoroidal space becomes less and less echogenic. And once it becomes totally echolus and something like a serous RD, that shows complete liquefaction, and that is the ideal time, if at all, you have to plan drainage of the supracoroidal hemorrhage. And indications for no, or not all supracoroidal hemorrhages need to be drained. Limited supracoroidal hemorrhages can be observed. But when you have a retinal detachment, regmatogenous RD complicating a supracoroidal detachment, or you have central retinal apposition, that is a kissing choroidals, or if you have a drop nucleus along with this, or if you have a large vitreous hemorrhage, breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage with a raised IOP and or intractable eye pain, these are situations where you will have to go ahead with draining the supracoroidal hemorrhage. Drainage technique, the optimal time is identification of clot liquefaction on B-scan, which can be varied from 7 to 14 days, usually after the event. And the optimal site is the highest point that you see of uh, choroidal detachment on the B-scan. That's the optimal site. And the optimal method is an adequate radial scleral uh, incision. If you have large clots, you can use even a trapdoor incision so that you can remove some amount of clots also. So I will show you two techniques uh, that we, ca we commonly use, the first one. In both these techniques, it's very important. You have an, uh, here I am using an infusion cannula into the AC, this is which, what we routinely use for vitrectomy surgery, but if you have an AC maintainer, you can put the AC maintainer. That is important to push the fluid, even if it is pseudophagic or aphagic also, it will push the fluid into the eye and push the supracoroidal hemorrhage um, out. And here I am using a trapdoor incision at the highest point as determined by the B scan and it's draining the supracoroidal fluid. You can see the initially the serous fluid comes and then the dark blood starts coming profusely. In the second video, a 25 gauge trucker cannula is used 4 mm from the pass plan. It's partially inserted. It is not going into the full cavity. It is going only into, it's only penetrating the sclera and going into the supracoroidal space and that uh, drains uh, large amount of blood. So if you don't have much, if you have a well liquefied um, supracoroidal hemorrhage, then uh, uh, pass plana incision itself is good enough using a trocar cannula is good enough to drain the blood. But if you suspect large amount of clots, then you can go a little posteriorly at the highest point and make a trapdoor incision. You may have to use, sometimes at the end, you may have to use some uh, blunt instrument or a cotton tip applicator to remove the clots and other things uh, from the uh, wound. 
you need not suture these wounds. You can leave it alone. So the prognosis depends on the presence of an intact posterior capsule is a good prognostic indi indicator. Use of systemic posteroids and meticulous uh, and persistent re secondary reconstruction, RD surgeries, corneal transplant, all these uh, add on to the prognostic, um, uh, act, makes the prognosis better. And with modern VR techniques, um, some uh, very various studies have shown 39% to 67% achieving a visual acuity better than 20 by 200. The poor prognostic factors are massive vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, incarceration of retina in the wound, and large supracordial hemorrhages extending 360 degrees. So wishing you all um, a happy sleep without nightmares in OR. Thank you.